So now, Buddhologists, we're about to leave India and see the subsequent uh, history of Buddhism as it left that country of its origin. And uh, my own teacher, Dr. Yamada, said nothing conceptually unique happens in Buddhism outside of India. And I exclaimed, what about Thailand, Tibet, Japan? And in fact, he said, nothing new changes, but practices, they do evolve. And of course, the first thing to know about the Theravada traditions of Buddhism, uh, primarily found in Southeast Asia, but also South Asia in Sri Lanka, and a few other places, is to know that the Theravada claimed to be unchanged from the time of the Buddha himself and go back to the Theravada school that was around in the earliest days of early Indian Buddhism. Having lived in Theravada, Thailand, a country of over 95% Buddhists, I can say it is the classic Buddhist culture with a king governing the Sangha or the Buddhist community. And of course, uh, you can, one can see signs of Buddhism throughout the kingdom, but one thing to note is that Mahayana and Theravada co-evolve. So while we can look at a map like this and see regions defined, in fact, we can find Mahayana elements throughout the Theravada countries and vice versa. Of course, the first thing to remember again is the Buddha's own teaching about no self, co-originating interrelationship, and the Four Noble Truths uh, along with the Eightfold Path. So those things are shared among all Buddhist traditions. But some things like the Buddhas we see in this image, uh, those are developed in Mahayana regions uh, as we discussed in our third unit on the emergence of the Mahayana. So a few basic differences can be found between the Theravada and its liberal, more northern cousin, the Mahayana. Uh, one is, of course, the Theravada, like the Buddha taught, uh, is about the individual, not masses of groups and society levels. The first thing to remember about Theravada Buddhism is that it's individualistic. It's not seeking the salvation of whole masses uh, of individuals like we'll see and emerge in some Mahayana traditions. Also, there's the figure of the Arhat, one who has given up all passion, versus uh, the figure of the Bodhisattva, who stays behind in Nirvana to help other beings attain their own full awakening. The Theravada rely on the earliest provable sutras, whereas the Mahayana make them up based on earlier sutras and of course are far more liberal than the conservative Theravada. For the Theravada, uh, Nirvana is an otherworldly, unconditioned realm, but for the Mahayana, uh, Nirvana is to be found right here in this world in which we live right now. And finally, there's the difference between the use of Pali or the textual script uh, in Theravada versus the Sanskrit, as we saw with Indian Mahayana and later vernacular languages such as Tibet and Chinese and Japanese. So the Theravada go back, we can see in this map uh, in the south of India uh, where they will predominate. In a general way, we can say Theravada Buddhist countries blend uh, spirit worship with Buddhism. This does not mean that if a monk is participating in a spirit ritual in Sri Lanka or cleansing spirits from a house in Theravada that they have given up their rationality of the Buddhist tradition, but more that principle of upaya or an approach that encourages people's connection with Buddhism through whatever avenue appeals to them and speaks to them. 
So we'll find Buddhism blending with lots of things as it travels through the rest of Asia, but in South and Southeast Asia, it will be spirit cults as well as a repetition of the classic Buddhist political structure whereby the king serves as a guardian uh, of the tradition, sometimes reforming the monks. And the Sangha is also deemed superior to the king at the same time. We can say with the Theravada themselves that while the tradition goes back to the Buddha, more specifically it goes back to Emperor Ashoka, that great codifier of Buddhist traditions in India, who sent his son Mahinda to Sri Lanka uh, to convert uh, King Tissa there at Anuradhapura. Then in time his sister Sangamita Terry will also arrived to establish the Bhikshuni Sangha, uh, just as the Buddha had done in his own life. Her arrival in Sri Lanka continues that Buddhist appeal to women that accounts for its spread throughout Asia, relatively speaking. From Sri Lanka, Theravada Buddhism will spread along the coasts uh, and making its way to modern day Burma or Myanmar and Thailand, uh, even as far as China, we'll see Sri Lankan monks ordaining new monks into the Buddhist tradition. Of course, it's important to remember there were major monastic universities in India. In the north were Nalanda and Vikramashila with all branches of Buddhists at those, and likewise in the south, uh, in the Chola Empire, uh, was Kanchi. Uh, in Kanchi, we see uh, a monastic university with perhaps a Theravada stronghold, but also brought in major figures in the rest of Buddhism in Asia, uh, no less than Padmasambhava, who will bring Tantric Buddhism to Tibet, or Dharmapala, who will teach Yogacara philosophy to Xuanzang, the Chinese traveler, or Bodhidharma, uh, emerging from there to go on to Central Asia and then China, establishing the, the Chan Buddhist meditation sect tradition, and who will incorporate many Taoist elements into Buddhist tradition. So Kanchi is a major center back in the day. Kanchi is situated in the Chola dynasty, which, wow, pro-Hindu in terms of government ideology, political ideology, uh, nevertheless, uh, was tolerant to many forms of Buddhism and through the Chola empire, this is how Buddhism will spread. This is the longest lived empire in history spanning 1,500 years. And from Kanchi will emerge Buddhaghosa, arguably the heavy hitter of the Theravada tradition. The voice of the Buddha is what his name means. And he will go from Kanchi to Sri Lanka to establish not only Buddhism as the official religion, but Theravada Buddhism and the Pali language as the sacred language of Buddhism. He posits his own definition of sabhava in Pali or svabhava in Sanskrit, the self-essence, the entity, the, the reality. Uh, in this case, though, his analysis had nothing to do with ontology or studying being, but rather elucidating a number of strict definitions for essential topics in Buddhist tradition. So, as you might imagine, a very conservative thinker did not provide new original ideas so much, although he was the first to distinguish shamatha, or stopping thoughts, from vipassana, uh, theoretical analytical insight, or at least to elucidate the boundaries between the two clearly. And we're told uh, prefers meditating on colorful images as opposed to the breathing meditation that was more traditional.
conservative Buddhist practice. Like just about every Buddhist tradition uh, outline a path to awakening and the various stages and experiences one has through each stage of awakening. And so the Visuddhimagga or Path of Purity or the Pure Path uh, was written by Buddha Gosa uh, to illustrate the traversal from ignorance to awakening. So in this, Buddha Gosa is working with the Mahavihara order established by King Tissa and it will remain the conservative school in Sri Lanka and tend to dominate uh, the dialogue in the day. King Tissa himself uh, will found the order. So with all religions, disputes emerge wherever the religions go and wherever there are humans, there will be disagreement. And so another order, the Abhayagiri order emerges uh, in contrast to the Mahavihara and eventually will eclipse it as it is friendlier to Mahayana innovations in thinking and practice that the conservative Mahavihara order will consider corrupt and deviations from what the Buddha taught. My first introduction to these amazing traditions was in the form of the book What the Buddha Taught by Walpola Rahula uh, an eminent Theravadan scholar from Sri Lanka, and the book says what it means. Exactly what the Buddha taught is what Buddhists should do, because he was the Buddha. Not millions of myriad people or Dalai Lamas or uh, incarnate American celebrities, but just one Buddha for all time in this universe. And so the Abhayagiri uh, Monastery uh, will maintain connections with the burgeoning tantric traditions in Kashmir uh, all the way to China. This same Chola dynasty that had been there in the time of Ashoka is still around. And again, it's pro-Hindu, even though many Buddhist traditions and Kanchi, the monastic university, uh, were encouraged and taught tolerated uh, in that empire, but uh, in one particular invasion and part of the history that is creating problems in Sri Lanka today is the conflict between Hindu and Buddhist forces there. And this will wipe out both the Bhikkhu Sangha for men and the Bhikkhuni Sangha for women, nuns. With the new capital at Palanarua, uh, King Vijayabahu I will seek help in reordaining monks from King Anurata of Burma. And thus, the Buddhist monkhood is reestablished in Sri Lanka, but the Bhikkhuni Sangha was not reestablished. The claim was that monks from uh, what was Thailand and Burma at the time, that there was no Bhikkhuni Sangha, uh, and thus no legitimate establishment for a new one as the reasoning goes. So this one event accounts for the disappearance of the Bhikshuni or Bhikkhuni Sangha, the order of women nuns in the Theravada traditions. And so this long tradition of Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka establishes it as an authority for the other Theravada countries. We'll see uh, uh, the exchange between Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka intellectually and in terms of practice and trade to be quite extreme. And like other Buddhist nations, uh, even today, the Maha Sami, the great master of Sri Lankan Buddhism, tends to set the stage uh, for what is kosher or authentic Buddhist practice in Sri Lanka today. Of course, by sea trade, and especially the merchants and monks traveling with them, Buddhism will spread to Indonesia, where we're surprised to find elements of the later Tantric Buddhism developing there at such an early age and so far away from its Central Asian homeland in Tibet, Mongolia, and the like. Through the work of the Buddhist Sri Vijaya and Shaila Indra dynasties, 
uh, we'll see the establishment of the largest Buddhist complex in history at Borobudur. Much of this was uncovered only in the last century as Buddhism in Indonesia was largely unknown until recently due to the waves of Islamic conversions that are happening from the time of the Mongol conquests in Asia. Uh, likewise, in Indonesia, there will be increasing conversion to Islam. And perhaps one of the best known examples of Buddhist civilization uh, is the Khmer civilization and its great temple at Angkor, uh, the Angkor Wat. Like other regions in Southeast Asia, the Chola dynasty will have spread Hinduism first, but subsequent centuries will reveal a shift towards Buddhist practice. Again, the caste system is hard to transplant from one culture to another and is rather built in to uh, Hinduism, hence the appeal to women for Buddhism and uh, also the appeal to merchants and all of those who see themselves as equal beings to other beings. And we'll find uh, elements again of Mahayana even in this period uh, with King Jayavarman II, uh, very friendly to Mahayana traditions. And of course, throughout Southeast Asia, Buddhism will become the state religion. This is no less true of the great Thai leader, Ram Kam Heng, uh, who will also make Buddhism the state religion and at the same time uh, be developing the Thai script based on Pali and other Indian examples. As we see in this first uh, of the Thai governments, the Sukho Thai uh, kingdom, so from there, we'll see Theravada Buddhism spread its way across Siam, or modern-day Thailand, all the way to the modern nation of Lao, where again we'll find some Mahayana and Tantric elements. And so a bit delayed until the 16th century, but Theravada Buddhism then also becomes the state religion of the Lansang Empire uh, of Lao. In these centuries, Vietnam, the South, will, will largely give way to Mahayana traditions, especially the Chan, also known as the Zen tradition. Meditation Buddhism from China will tend to predominate in Vietnam, unlike the rest of Southeast Asia, although the South tended to remain predominantly Theravada. The colonial period will see a variety of reactions uh, from Theravada Buddhists to uh, this incursion from European invaders. So much of Buddhist tradition in now this period is about resistance to colonial cultural hegemony. The only place escaping colonization is the nation of Thailand, uh, where we can say Theravada classic tradition was best preserved due to this fact. During this colonial period, however, the influence went both ways. We can see Buddhism influencing European thinkers such as Schopenhauer or David Hume, among many others, and as well in Sri Lanka, Henry Steele Alcott will come from America as a retired ex-Colonel Presbyterian who will seek to defend the Sri Lankans against this colonialism developing even a Buddhist catechism to answer the Catholic catechism. So in Burma and Thailand and Lao, uh, wilderness forms of Buddhism are often seen as more pure by some kings and leaders and often lead to the reformation of the big urban monastic centers. And so from 1180, uh, we'll see Burmese importing Buddhism directly from Sri Lanka, uh, the pattern that will predominate throughout Southeast Asia. In later Burma, the British will divide the country and uh, will not disturb the running of the Sangha, 
the Buddhist community as much as in Sri Lanka. And King Mindon, the last king of Burma, will hold a fifth Buddhist council uh, as a response to this threat of colonialism, even though it's not largely recognized in the rest of the Buddhist world. Of course, the chaos caused by the British colonial period, we can blame the modern violence in Burma, I think largely on that colonial presence of British in Burma. So again, Vietnam is the odd one out, largely Mahayana due to the hegemony culturally of China throughout, especially the north part of Vietnam. The Vietnamese will be reacting to Catholic persecution as they saw it of Buddhism, uh, culminating in this famous scene uh, as Thich Quang Duc immolates himself to protest uh, the persecution of Buddhism in, in that country. In Burma, the Shwedagon Temple still stands as a great monument to, to Buddhist culture of that, that nation. But in the post-colonial period, Unu will emerge to establish a Buddhist socialism uh, and seek to counteract the forces of communism with that but eventually, Burma will turn towards fascism where it is today uh, with the coup of General Ne Win. Um, and today, even Buddhism is caught up in this violence against the Rohingya Muslims there. In Thailand, King Rama IV, or Mong uh, will be modernizing not only the nation, but also the Sangha itself. And prior to becoming a king, he had founded a reform movement, the Tamayut sect, uh, in existence today. And then his successor, the great king, Rama V, uh, will create the Mahanikaya sect, or the great sect, if you will, uh, including all other traditions, even the Mahayana ones. Uh, into another social governmental basket in addition to the Tamayut sect of King Rama IV. In India, Buddhism wasn't finished. The writer of the Indian constitution, Ambedkar, uh, who enshrined so many equal rights in the Indian constitution, thought, well, in this colonial period, outcasts, or those outside the caste, the Dalits, they're also known, they can't join the Christian faith, it's the colonizer religion. And Hinduism subjugates them, that's why they're in this low social level to begin with. So he decides rationally that the Dalit should convert to Buddhism. What kind of Buddhism? Theravada Buddhism. But again, he's seen Buddhism more as a social protest and thought some things like the uh, doctrine of no self was too pessimistic and should be put to the side. I might argue without the no self doctrine, however, I don't know that we really have Buddhism. Then the biggest issue facing Theravada nations today is a big issue that faces all religions, and that is what is to be the role of women in the tradition. As we saw, Chola forces wiped out the bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sangha uh, in Sri Lanka. And the claim was that there were no bhikkhunis in then Siam or Burma uh, to reinstate it in Sri Lanka. So it hasn't existed. Uh, since really the Mongol invasion in Burma wiped it out entirely. And so in Thailand and Burma, for example, uh, they're relocated to a novice level rather than full bhikkhunis or nuns. They are called mechi uh, and practitioners uh, of Buddhism in a in very devout but uh, they're not considered monks. And of course, like Sri Lanka, uh, Buddhism has a supreme patriarch in Thailand who has declared 
Uh, the ordination of women is simply forbidden. There is no legitimate Theravada ordination for women. However, there is a Vinaya of the Mahayana, the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya, uh, that is used to ordain women into the East Asian Sangha for women, the Bhikshuni Sangha, uh, and finally the Tibetan nuns are ordained according to the Mula Sarvasti Vada Vinaya or rules. The rules don't differ too much, but since there's no legitimate representation of the lineage, uh, uh, he has declared that women cannot be ordained as monks in Thailand. Some reforming leaders like Dhammananda Bhikkhuni are seeking to change that. She herself was ordained into the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya traditions by East Asian Bhikshunis and it can be said that arguably the Taiwanese uh, order of female nuns is the strongest among modern Buddhist nations. Uh, and so her argument is in part the Buddha himself ordained the earliest nuns, so a man can do that job. But this is an issue that will be resolved in the decades to come, no doubt, as it is being resolved in all the religions of the planet today. Then finally, there are scandals, such as the huge Wat Dhammakaya uh, Buddhist tradition in Thailand. Uh, we'll find them everywhere. These kind of scandals occur in every religion, but as I like to say, we can't blame the scandals on the founders. And so I would never blame uh, the scandals connected with any Buddhist tradition on Siddhartha Gautama Shakyamuni, who we call the Buddha. So that's a thumbnail of what happens in to Theravada Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia. And then it remains only uh, to examine what happens in East Asia, in the Mahayana traditions, in Central Asia, the Tantric traditions, and finally, how has Buddhism taken form in the Western world?